Hello and welcome to Weathersnap. It's Thursday, the 24th of November. Joining me this week, meteorologist Helen Roberts and climate correspondent, as well as senior Met Office press officer, Graham Madge. And this week, we're discussing the last throes of November. How wet will it actually be? The Father of All Clouds has an anniversary coming up. Helen has more on that in a moment. And Graham gives us the lowdown of COP27. First of all, Helen and Graham stormed Denise earlier this week across the Mediterranean. It was vicious, wasn't it, Graham? It certainly was. We had a system named by the Spanish, given orange warning, and that brought heavy rain to parts of the central Mediterranean. But in addition to the severe weather that we saw, it also, the way the system curled round, it also brought incredible snowfall to the Alps. So some of the alpine runs are quite pleased because obviously they've had more snow for, for skiers. But further south, obviously, there has been considerable impacts. And as I understand, the situation is not going away anytime soon. Yes, it was quite a, a deep area of low pressure. And we reported last week on the snow and the fact that some of the slopes weren't opening. Some of the resorts were delayed in opening because of the lack of snow. So it's a bittersweet situation. Helen, how unusual is this? What we've got at the moment is a, a rather distorted jet stream. So that means it's in what we call an amplified pattern where the jet stream is meandering a long way north and south and causing these storms to be directed through these parts of the Mediterranean. And this is different from sometimes what we do see when we see a deep area of low pressure, which we call a medicane. It's a slightly different type of system. Yeah, that's right, Claire. So it's slightly different to what has been termed a medicane. And just for those who haven't heard the term before, this is a portmanteau word. So it's a combination of the words Mediterranean and hurricane. It's not quite like a traditional tropical hurricane, but it does have tropical characteristics and they're, they're more symmetrical in shape and these can develop in situ. So this area of low pressure that we're talking about at the moment is something a little bit different to that. It's more like the typical areas of low pressure that we get across the UK. And another system hot on its heels across Italy. That's right. Yeah, this is uh, another powerful area of low pressure just to the west of Italy, but it will push into Italy on Friday before sinking its way southwards. So Sicily and the toe of Italy bearing the brunt of this storm on Saturday before it clears away into Liberia. And this is likely to bring impacts such as flooding, perhaps some storm surge, very strong winds associated with this and an awful lot of rain. Yeah, it's not a great time to be travelling to the Mediterranean because not only has Italy seen a lot of bad weather, obviously Iberia as well, but further east, just off and on right the way through the season, Cyprus has really caught the brunt of storm clouds. And yet again, the forecast for the next few days is for heavy showers. And it's fact this time of year where we see the winds coming in from the north from cooler air and then flowing over the warmer, relatively warm seas of the Mediterranean, producing these storms, which just have been sitting over Cyprus off and on for at least the last few weeks or so. Graeme, it's an interesting time of year for this part of the world, not only because of the storms. It is. I mean, when you think of in and around the Levant and the eastern Mediterranean, um, with water spouts being a potential feature of the forecast over the next couple of days. Yes, they can be quite spectacular, can't they? I mean, I, I saw on YouTube just the other day this most incredible water spouts. There's two types of water spout there, the sort of the normal ones, which are lovely to almost sail close to. And then you get these tornadic bursts over the sea, which is where the energy is just primed and it's explosive. And you see these massive sort of gushes of water just vortexing around. It's absolutely incredible. Very dramatic, I'm sure. And as weather fans, it would be very spectacular to see, but it's not the sort of thing that you'd expect to see on your tourist brochure, is it, when you're booking your holiday for the eastern Mediterranean at this time of year? No, not at all. Um, yeah, not great at all. In fact, the weather's been very lively over the UK. There's been numerous warnings through the last week. Gales, severe gales, high waves, heavy rain, really, really heavy rain. Um, what are the stats looking like for November so far, Graham? Well, it's been an interesting month, Claire, hasn't it? Um, obviously, 
coming off the back of the drought over summer, the water companies and customers are very eager to know what's happening with rainfall. I can say that although the figures aren't complete yet, that everywhere apart from Northern Ireland has reached the monthly November average rainfall. If you're living in East Sussex, you're going to be approaching double the amount of rainfall that you'd expect. So that picks up the fact that the Channel Coast and other parts have been particularly wet. East Sussex will also likely be in the news again for the weather because it's been the warmest location so far relative to average with maximum temperatures about two and a half degrees above the levels that we'd expect for November over the last 30 years. So that's something to look out for. Relative lack of cloud over Northern Ireland has made Londonderry the sunniest location so far with 82 hours of sunshine. But this relatively cloud-free influence that's brought us the sunshine has also brought some of those overnight temperatures down. So parts of Northern Ireland are seeing the lowest overnight temperatures relative to normal, but it has been very warm generally. So everywhere is going to be well above average and these figures are just relative. Yeah, interesting. It's really been a a busy month for forecasters after that sort of warm start and then it turning so wet. And in contrast, yeah, Northern Ireland seeing that fog and those very low temperatures. But warm and wet trends in our weather through winter is something that climate scientists have been warning us about for many, many years now. And talking about climate, yeah, we've just come to the end of COP27. Graham, what did you make of it? There was a lot of optimism from Glasgow from COP26 and many thought that that would be transferred and passed on to COP27 in Egypt. Before the conference, we were reporting the need for much greater ambition on cutting fossil fuel use by 2030. I'm afraid we didn't see that. Um, There's still a lot more progress and ambition needed on reducing fossil fuels. However, it wasn't all bad by any means. There was a lot of discussion about things like loss and damage, for example. This is where those countries that are experiencing climate change impacts can be expected to be compensated. There's no actual money around that process yet. That's still to come through. But COP27 was important because it did open the door to those discussions and it is now on the agenda. Um, There was a bit of progress on methane emissions. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas and very important. There was a bit of progress on that. And also there was a lot of discussion and progress made around things like nature-based solutions. This is where you can actually harness nature to help solve some of the problems by you know, planting forests or seagrass beds or using nature to soften some of the impacts and helping us to adapt to the climate change. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, an intense two weeks. Obviously, more details on our climate newsletter. Go to our website. You can subscribe to that. Loads of really good information coming out of there. It's a fortnightly letter which showcases the best of climate science coming out of the Met Office and beyond. Helen, let's chat with you because you've got a busy weekend coming up and you're talking clouds, I believe. Yes, an exciting weekend in the meteorological calendar because this coming Monday, actually the 28th of November, is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Luke Howard. Now, Luke Howard, famous name in the weather community, he was the namer of clouds. So all those Latin names that we have for clouds, cumulus, stratus, cirrus, nimbus, he was the the guy who came up with that system of identifying and classifying clouds. And despite the fact that he came up with this system over 200 years ago, it's still very much in use today. And it was a real breakthrough moment in the world of weather. And actually, that wasn't the only thing he did. He was also one of the first to identify the urban heat island effect, something else which is still very topical at the moment. So I'm heading to London on Sunday and there's a whole weekend of events going on at the Lordship Wreck in Tottenham. Uh, Have a look online if you're in the area and would like to come along. There's all sorts of events and talks, workshops going on throughout the weekend and into Monday as well. And as I say, I'll be there on Sunday alongside Richard Hamlin and Gavin Pretapini. We'll be talking about various aspects of weather and clouds. 
obviously Gavin, the Cloud Appreciation Society guy who we interviewed many, many years ago, actually, a really lively chap who absolutely loves clouds and really doesn't like blue sky thinking. I think that's one of his top lines. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. He's always a fantastic speaker. So yeah, as I say, if you're in the area, do come along. Talking about blue skies, actually, I listened to Dr. Mark McCarthy earlier and he was saying that East Anglia could have its sunniest year on record, but obviously we'll keep you posted on all those yearly stats. But we do love clouds here at the Met Office. Graham, what's your favourite cloud? Well, I have to say, I was very fortunate. I was in Boston. I was on a whale watching trip. The trip got cancelled, much to my disappointment, before we'd seen any whales. Pulling into the harbour, we were warned that there would be potential for bad weather. And looking up at the harbour at Boston, we had the most spectacular display of mammatus clouds. It was the first time I'd seen them. I didn't really know what they were at the time. And then we were treated to the most phenomenal thunderstorm that I have ever experienced. So that, as a wonderful memory with family, has to be my favourite. I like that. Yes, proper heavy weather, isn't it? You can see those Mamatis clouds just sort of dangling down, Helen. Is that one of your top five? I've not been lucky enough to, to see those in all their glory, so that's on my bucket list. I have been fortunate enough to see Kelvin Helmholtz clouds, which are an incredible spectacle. Those are the ones that look a bit like waves breaking, a line of waves breaking. So that was an exciting day. But I have to say one of my favourite just regular common or garden clouds is the cumulonimbus. Um, they can be so impressive, especially when they're sort of isolated against a backdrop of blue sky and you get that big anvil on top and more especially because they're obviously the precursor of thunderstorms which are one of my favourite weather types. Yes I love a, a thunderhead as they call them in the States. In fact um, when I was in the Met Office College many moons ago I remember the the cloud expert describing these cumulonimbus clouds and it was the first time I actually recognised or identified them along a horizon as I was driving back um, to my house that that evening. It was just a spectacular uh, sight. My favourite, I have to be, because I, I do like a bit of blue sky, certainly in the summer. Uh, but when you see some cirrocumulus clouds, they're tiny little mm. uh, sort of bubbles of cloud high up in the atmosphere. I always feel that that's quite a nice sort of mix, a nice uh, combination of cloud and sunlight. And, and they're very pretty indeed. But I've never seen Mamatis clouds and I, I love to see them. And the other one I've never seen is a proper shelf cloud. And you see those on those fantastic uh, National Geographic sort of images of these almost looming clouds just sort of just engulfing a whole area. But yeah, clouds, you've got to love them, got to hate them. This week, I think a lot of people are sick and tired of seeing those grey looming beasts in the sky, which have brought so much rain to so many. And through Friday, uh, a slight ridge coming in, a slight ridge, I say, uh, for England and Wales, perhaps even eastern Scotland, seeing some brighter skies. But still, those showers keep on coming across central, western and northern areas of Scotland, clipping Northern Ireland and a windy start to Friday as well. And then overnight into Saturday, Saturday starts fairly clear, a few fog patches in the east, even a touch of frost, but it's not going to last. Uh, the weather is so mobile at the moment, the jet stream again dumping another system on our shores. So through Saturday morning, we'll see the first of the cloud and the rain arriving across Northern Ireland. The wind's really picking up some strength. We'll see sort of bumps in that weather system on Sunday, producing more rain through the day. Could linger on in the southeast. In between those, some brighter skies, a few showers lurking out there and temperatures through the weekend. Well, we'll see a slight spike in those values coming in 10 to 13, 14 degrees Celsius. So that's the forecast. Lots of clouds to look at and spot. Before we go, let's head over to Ollie Claydon, who has last week's highs and lows. Here are your weather extremes for Monday the 12th of November to Sunday the 20th of November. The warmest place was Hurstmanso, East Sussex where it reached 17.6 degrees last Monday. The lowest temperature was during the early hours of Saturday morning in Catesbridge, County Down, where it dipped to minus 4.2 degrees. Last week was very wet, with flooding across eastern Scotland. The highest rainfall in 24 hours was on Friday the 18th of November, when a Boyne in Aberdeenshire saw 71.4 millimetres. And the highest daily sunshine occurred also on Friday in Liscombe, Devon, 
with 7.2 hours of sunshine. Thanks very much, Ollie, and thanks, Helen and Graham. That's all from Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir, and editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.